ओम वसुदेवसुत देव कंसचाणुरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गु सो इन द भगवद गीता वी आर स्टडिंग चैप्टर फोर इन द टू अर्लियर चैप्टर्स चैप्टर्स टू एंड थ्री श्री कृष्ण हैज टॉट अर्जुन वेदांत द साइंस ऑफ सेल्फ रियलाइजेशन सोल्यूशन टू ऑल अवर प्रॉब्लम्स द अटेनमेंट ऑफ ह्यूमन गोल्स द अल्टीमेट ह्यूमन गोल ऑफ एनलाइटनमेंट दैट इज पॉसिबल थ्रू सेल्फ रियलाइजेशन एंड दैट इज वॉट वॉज टॉट in the second chapter question remain that yes self realization is uh, is our goal is our path and our goal but what do i do with this life the life that i'm leading in arjuna's case the war that he had to fight do i fight this do i not fight it do i lead my life in a different way do i become a monk so that's the third chapter and sri krishna says that karma yoga he teaches him karma yoga how to sp- spiritualize his life so whatever action we are doing uh, we um, do it as a worship of god spiritualize our our life you see these are the two primary questions in spiritual life you know uh, how do i realize god or how do i become enlightened that's one and what do i do with this life uh, my other than spiritual what else is there in my life how do i deal with that how to how do i spiritualize it how do i connect it to my spiritual life so having done this then sri krishna at the beginning of the fourth chapter he praises this knowledge he says this is an ancient knowledge and uh, i gave this knowledge at the beginning of creation to vivaswan this the um, sun god and who passed it down in a lineage of yoga teachers uh, down to manu the founder of the human race and ikshwaku the first king of the solar dynasty these are terms very fam- familiar in india surya vamsha chandra vamsha and all of that and so not one thing arjuna is a warrior he is not a monk he is not a brahmin priest arjuna is a warrior a kshatriya and all of these uh, they were uh, like ikshwaku so it's a lineage of philosopher kings so it, in one way krishna is telling arjuna this this thing is very practical for you look your ancestors they practice this kind of spirituality then he also mentioned something interesting that this spirituality got lost over time it declines and we know how religion does not remain as fresh as it does you know, at the time of the founder and over time many things happen it becomes organized politics enters into it wealth enters into it um then rituals comes into it all kinds of theology uh, theologies and theories come into it and then what is essential and what is non essential gets mixed up so he says i uh, again i have come and i'm giving you the same teaching so look how he establishes a lineage a pedigree of the teaching this is that ancient knowledge which was there at the beginning of creation and this is the same thing that i'm teaching you now now arjuna asks a question like a good lawyer he immediately finds the loophole in this whole sequence how is it that you taught at the beginning of creation and you are teaching me you are my age you were born maybe just a few years before me uh, how did you teach the sun god at the beginning of creation so this is the occasion for krishna to reveal that great secret that he is an incarnation he is not just a charioteer he is not just arjuna's friend he is not just the son of vasudeva uh, he is he is not just a yogi or a wise person but actually the incarnation of god and he says that um i have had many lives so have you but you you don't know them i know them which means my knowledge is uh, is i'm omniscient you have lost uh, knowledge of what has happened to you in the past but i know all of this not only my births but i know your births also i know everything omniscience means he is god i taught at the beginning of creation now in vedic uh, in the vedic system the vedic knowledge is um, timeless it's with god so by by the vedas as vivekananda said no books are meant it means eternal spiritual knowledge so in every cycle of creation god is supposed to reveal it um, to 
those at the beginning of creation and then that this knowledge is passed down from teacher to student and so on at one time it gets codified into books so that means when krishna is claiming that i did this he is claiming that in the beginning of creation if i gave this knowledge then who am i i am god so that's the claim but literally he is not vishnu or narayana who is uh, who is god or you know brahman he is krishna so he is an incarnation of god so god has appeared in this form so this is the divine mystery of the incarnation and we talked about how is this incarnation different from the rest of us we have bodies the incarnation is also has a body looks like us seems to be born seems to age and die just like us seems to have sufferings in life and challenges in life just like us even if we we grant that the avatar or incarnation is very holy very spiritual uh, extraordinary but there are also holy and spiritual people how is the incarnation different from say a jivan mukta an enlightened person so how are the uh, what did what conclusion did we come to so this whole theory of incarnation avatar uh, makes uh, in essence a few points first of all the incarnation is uh, is comes out of freedom god incarnates in a human form or in hinduism in many forms so in the human form uh, out of freedom we do not incarnate out of freedom we come because of our past karma god comes out of his own choice nobody gave us a choice we don't remember filling out the form these will be my parents this is where i'll be born this kind of body i want this much money i will have none of these are our options nothing it is all dictated by my past karma and that's why i've got this life this body and the major events of this life um but uh, god incarnates in full freedom in full omniscience in full knowledge the the uh, second difference would be the body uh, of the uh, of the incarnation is not like us so this is the the whole theory of the in uniqueness of incarnations our body is made of material elements five elements in sanskrit pancha bhautika but the incarnation's body is supposed to be a direct product of maya krishna says that by using my maya now again and again he's he is look he's identifying himself with god my maya who can say my maya only god brahman can say that so i have i have embodied myself we don't use that language we don't say i have embodied myself i have descended upon this world no we are born uh, helplessly so so that is another difference and then the purpose the purpose is very different we are born because of our karma and the purpose is to exhaust the results of our karma we get the results of our good karma and our bad karma uh, a part of that which is called prarabdha karma that is exhausted in this birth and we generate new karma as we go along ensuring further births good or bad and the ultimate purpose of all of this is supposed to be god realization enlightenment moksha so this is our purpose but that's not at all the purpose of the incarnation the incarnation does not have any karma uh, this the incarnation is not under the sway of karma god in fact is the master one of the terms used for god in uh, in, in hinduism is karma dhyaksha the lord of karma who gives us our karma the results of our karma so the lord is is not at, at all under the sway of karma um so the purpose of the lord is our welfare especially our spiritual welfare when spirituality declines the lord comes to uphold spirituality um, ethics morality spirituality all of that it it seems to decline and the lord comes to uh, uphold um, ethical life moral life for the welfare of the world especially for the welfare of those who are seeking spirituality um one might ask why only spirit why does the god why does god come as incarnation only for spirituality only for religion why not for the economy or for for taking care of the covid or something like that you know the economy is going into a cycle economy is famous for going through cycles not just religion so if god could come as an economic incarnation and uh, rescue the economy no 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 only for religion or spirituality why because again it ties back to the ultimate purpose of this entire creation and our existence our existence is not to be an economic person our existence ultimately is for en- for enlightenment 
for realizing our oneness with God. That's God's, God has a very one-track mind. God, that God is very clear about God's purpose. God's purpose is to lead us to enlightenment. The rest of it, civilization, science, art, economy, all of it is part of our enlightenment process. They are not separate. It's a grand project, but ultimately it's enlightenment which matters, God realization which matters. Even human civilization is part of the process towards enlightenment. Aurobindo used to say life itself is yoga. Life itself is yoga. The whole of life is actually yoga. Um, when you know it and you pursue spiritual practices consciously, you call yourself a yogi, a spiritual seeker. Otherwise, you just say, I'm living my life. But living that life is also part of God's plan, ultimately to take us towards God realization. Do it knowingly, you are a spiritual seeker, a yogi. Do it unknowingly, I'm just drifting along in life, and you're just living your life. Um, so that is the purpose. Now, in the seventh verse, so Sri Krishna is talking to, uh, is telling Arjuna about the purpose of the incarnation of God. Let me do the, already people have asked questions um, and made comments. We'll, we'll go through that. Let me just read the famous verses. People, those who know the Bhagavad Gita, um, even if they know just one verse, it's usually this one, the seventh verse. Um, in India, in say the Bhagavad Gita, the, many people just know this one person particular verse and that's the seventh verse of the fourth chapter. Yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata abhyutthanam adharmasya tadatmanam srejamyaham whenever, whenever, O sign of the Bharatas, righteousness declines and unrighteousness prevails, I project myself. So, your incarnation, when do you come and why do you come? Here is the answer. Whenever dharma, glanir bhavati means when it declines, uh, when there is confusion regarding what is religion for, is it true? No more than, no more, more so than in our day and age, where the whole idea of religion is under attack. Somebody said, in all of known history, Never has there been a time like ours where large numbers, if not the majority, but large numbers of people are agnostic or atheistic. They uh, are not interested in religion or they actively disbelieve religion. Um, so never has there been such a time in, in human history. There have been times and all throughout human history there have been skeptics. People who don't believe in it, people who question the very validity of religion, people who are out and out materialists. We hear of charvakas in ancient Indian philosophy. So it's been a popular philosophy throughout. The out and out materialist who says, "All I, I believe only what I see with my senses. And this material world alone is, is true. My body is, I am my body. What is the self? The body is the self. That's it. We are, I am created with the birth of the body and I'll die with the death of the body. It's entirely a material existence. And their tribe continues to grow. Now it is a, a very powerful philosophy, with, especially with the support of and the power and prestige of science. So, Glanir Bhavati, decline in uh, religion and spirituality. Not just spirituality, I mean the whole of religion. Whole of religion declines. By the way, when I say whole of religion, uh, Vedanta or Hinduism is very clear what is meant. At the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, Shankaracharya says, the Vedic religion has two aspects, Pravritti Lakshana, Nivritti Lakshana. Pravritti Lakshana means the outward moving aspects. Literally, Pravritti means outward moving aspects. Um, Swami Vivekananda called it the centripetal and centrifugal. So one kind of religion is that which projects itself outwards. You want a prosperous life, you want God's protection. Uh, primitive man wanted that. Let God watch over my tribe. Let him protect my children from diseases. Let the crops prosper. Let the enemies be destroyed. Uh, let our cattle increase. So all kinds of materially and we expect God's 
protection for a good uh, material life, earthly life. So that is called pravritti lakshana dharma and do not denigrate it for two reasons. First of all, the majority of people who believe in religion believe in that it for, for that. And the second thing is that is it protects the higher spirituality. God realization, moksha and all of that would not have been possible without the outer superstructure of religion. Temples and priests and churches and all of that. Though people go there for material benefits, this worldly or otherworldly benefits, that is the pravritti dharma, the outward religion, outward moving religion. But still, it is the foundation of religion. If that was not there, the other would also dis disappear. Somebody com compared it nicely to a coconut, that there is a hard shell outside and there is the delicious fruit, the, the delicious flesh of the coconut inside. That is what we want. But without the shell, the flesh of the coconut would perish, would not come to maturity and would perish. And people move from this outward moving religion to the inward moving religion. Uh, Sri Krishna later on will say, devotees are of four kinds. Those who want material things, those who want to be rescued from trouble, you know, in times of COVID, the interest in religion increases, not because people want enlightenment, people want, um, you know, safety, security, and a sense of peace, um, overcome anxiety. So, that's the outward kind of religion. But then he says that the third kind of devotee, first kind of devotee wants to be rescued from trouble. Second kind of devotee wants more things in life, a better life. Third kind of devotee inquires, is there God? What is the purpose of life? Can I experience God? Like Narendranath going to Ramakrishna and saying, have you seen God? So on. So, and the fourth kind of devotee is the one who has, is already enlightened, has seen God. So these are the four kinds and Krishna says they are all good. But the last one is specially dear to me. The first two belong to this outward moving religion. That means the pravritti lakshana dharma. The next two, the inquirer and the enlightened one. So we are all inquirers among us. One or two, a few, lucky few might be already enlightened. But we belong to the second kind of religion, the higher spirituality. Uh, which is called Nivritti Lakshana Dharma. But an incarnation comes for all of it. An incarnation does not come only for um, enlightenment or a few monks or highly advanced spiritual seekers, for everybody. Um, and that's what Krishna will talk about soon. All of religion is uplifted. When, so at that time I come. It is also characterized by not only a decline of religion, but also a bhyutthana madharmasya, um, an increase in, uh, in, in evil, in wickedness, in disbelief. Tadatmanam srijamyaham. Then I project myself forth. Myself, I project myself. So who is there prior to the incarnation? God only. Ishvara, Brahman, Saguna Brahman. So, so that is the purpose. What do you do? So, what are your activities? I will do the eighth one and then I will stop and take a few questions. Paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya chadushkritam dharma samsthapanathaya sambhavami yuge yuge For the protection of the virtuous, the destruction of the wicked and to secure establishment of righteousness, I am born in every age. Sambhavami yuge yuge. Incarnation comes. So multiple incarnations. This is a standard doctrine in Hinduism, especially Vaishnava Hinduism. Uh, God has come many times. Many people have heard of the 10 incarnations of Vishnu. But the Bhagavatam speaks of 24 incarnations and many, many incarnations. Incarnations, as Krishna says here, I come age after age. So when do I come? When in that, in that particular age, uh, religion declines, wickedness increases, then I come for the protection of religion. How do you protect religion? Two ways. One, paritranaya sadhunam. I, um, for the emancipation, for the protection of sadhu, sadhu means good people, virtuous people, people who follow dharma, religion, I come to protect them. And the second thing is vinashaya chadushkritam, for the destruction of the wicked. So, in, the, in these two ways, I protect religion. 
and the third one is dharma sangsthapanarthaya in order to rest establish or re-establish it literally means establish but it means re-establish actually um, so sort of revivify revitalize religion in every age i am born i come forth now paritranaya sadhunam for the welfare or protection of the, of the good protection might mean um, you know actual physical protection as rama you know he fights with the demons with his arrows uh, or krishna protects the pandavas uh, from the from the kauravas so the in the fight of between good and evil uh, the lord comes to protect the good but also specifically those who are spiritual seekers those who are already advanced those who want god god's the incarnation's first purpose is for them really the first beneficiary is the greatest beneficiaries of krishna are his close disciples the gopis and uh, like uddhava and arjuna directly and they will get enlightenment surely uh, the the first um, beneficiaries of jesus are the apostles first beneficiaries of chaitanya sri ramakrishna are the, the group of advanced spiritual seekers both monastic and householder who gather around they recognize the incarnation in the lifetime of the incarnation many might not recognize him um krishna was hated by the kauravas though loved by the pandavas um jesus only a small group of people recognized him others they reviled him and ultimately crucified him uh, the uh, sri ramakrishna was considered mad by most people in in the dakshineshwar kali temple only the closest devotees they recognized the divinity in this person in the lifetime but what is the proof then there is an incarnation during the lifetime and soon afterwards it grows tremendously as life goes by as time goes by centuries millennia the the presence of the incarnation keeps on growing over time we will completely forget forget all the other people no matter how great who lived around that time um but as centuries go by the stature of the incarnation will only grow so first beneficiary are those who are spiritual um then vinashaya cha duskritam so the destruction of the evil now in in ancient ages it might have been physical destruction of demons you hear of rama fighting against the demons or rishimha avatar coming and destroying the great demon king uh, rakshasa king uh, hiranyakashipu and so on uh, but now over time right now it might mean just reforming the wicked um, changing people from being grossly materialistic given to evil ways and rising them to a moral ethical life and finally to a spiritual life so that might that's might uh, what it means um i remember a funny incident which took place many many years ago about 15 years ago in india so i was invited to give a talk in a village outside calcutta and uh, they asked me so we'll send a vehicle vehicle for you is anybody else coming and i was surprised i said no that's i'm i have been told that i am supposed to go so, all right so i went to this village and it was really a proper village quite outside the city and they had put up a big stage with a with a tarp a tarpaulin on top of it and the villagers came uh, through the fields rice fields and came and sat in front on big mats to listen to it listen to the talk and there would always be a village expert because the crowd is uh, is fluid people are coming and people are le- leaving so they want me to be the star speaker so there is an expert who is, uh, who knows the village who knows that this is the peak of the crowd uh, so he says uh, he'll say i'll i'll come and tell you when to come on stage uh, and after this as he di- he did come and tell me swami come and um, come and give your talk now because after this the crowd is only going to decrease no it won't it won't increase any further so i went there how long should i speak oh before i my speech this is what i wanted to say which is relevant here there was this village school master school teacher who gave a very nice speech i still remember about incarnations he said in ancient ages the incarnation of god vishnu nrsingha avatar the half lion half man he comes and goes straight into the realm of the demons and kills the evil hiranyakashipu uh, there's a famous story 
and then um, in, the, in a, a later age comes Ramachandra, the incarnation Rama, who crosses the ocean and rescues Sita from Ravana and, and destroys Ravana and all the Rakshasas. And then in a still later age comes Krishna, who is right here in India and he fights the battle between uh, the, the, on the side of the good, the Pandavas against the Kauravas. And in this age, Sri Ramakrishna has come and the battlefield is in our hearts. In everybody's heart, there is a good and bad. And with the help of Sri Ramakrishna, the good forces within us will win over the bad forces. The, the good will win over the evil. So I thought, that's very interesting. He has gone from ancient ages, from interplanetary warfare to, in, you know, Hiranyakashipu and all, to Rama crossing of the ocean to Sri Lanka. That's an international warfare to the Kauravas and the Pandavas within India, that is an, like a civil war, to ultimately within internally within each of us, a battle between good and evil inside us. So I really liked that speech. And then I was asked to speak. And I asked, how long do I have to speak? And I, I'm not kidding you. They said, until the sun sets. I said, I've never heard of such a thing. Until the sun sets, just me? I said, that's what? We were whispering in my ear. That's why we asked you, is there somebody else coming? <laughs> you should have told me and I don't know how long it's going to take for the sun to set so I started as far back as I could with the birth of Sri Ramakrishna and I told the story in detail Sri Ramakrishna and uh, everything Kamar Pukur is coming to Dakshineshwar and the birth of Vivekananda um, so a holy mother the direct disciples and by the time Vivekananda goes to Chicago I'm looking uh, you know desperately at the sun you have to set because I'm running out of material. <laughs> and so anyway, it went off well enough. So destruction of the wicked in past ages might have meant these great mythical battles. Um, but it's basically a moral battle between good and evil. And more important, dharma samsthapanarthaya. So when Swami Vivekananda composed the salutation to Sri Ramakrishna, sthapakaya cha dharmasya. The one who establishes dharma. That is immediately a characteristic of an incarnation. So there itself Sri, uh, Swami Vivekananda is signaling that this is an incarnation of God. In fact Vivekananda said in his famous Calcutta address when he came back to India after his uh, first tour of the United States. So in Calcutta they gave him a big reception. And by the way many people don't know they sent him a bill for that afterwards. <laughs> As if he wanted the reception. So they gave him a big reception. In that, he gave a, he rarely referred to Sri Ramakrishna, to his master. But there he did. It was the city of his master, Sri Ramakrishna, and he referred to it. And he said, we have all heard of the incarnation of Rama in past ages and Krishna. Uh, such a thing is before us again, he says. Even then, though Sri Ramakrishna was already well known in Calcutta, uh, but still, to openly proclaim him an avatar, it's a pretty bold step. I mean, we can recognize him as a saint, as a wonderful mystic, maybe the greatest figure. As somebody recently said, uh, um, Ruth Harris, who's a professor at Oxford University, was giving a talk in, um, uh, at, at Harvard University. She's writing a new book on, on Vivekananda. And she said, the first time I've heard an academic say it out, out, and an academic of her stature from Oxford and talking at Harvard, she said, uh, so his master was Sri Ramakrishna, the greatest figure in Hinduism in modern times, possibly the greatest religious figure of our age. So this is the first time I'm hearing this coming from a high class, a top class secular scholar. Anyway, so Sthapakaya Dharma, the one who establishes religion. Uh, Swami Vivekananda also went on to say, those of you who are lucky, those who can see it, come and help in this work, the work of the avatara. Those who do not, then just stand aside. Do not oppose this, because this is the work of God. and You, you can only oppose it at your, at your own peril. Uh, just a minute. What is the establishment of religion? The establishment of religion is to show what true religion is. I have said this earlier. It's mixed up with, it goes undergoes decline. And imagine the amount of decline in Hinduism, especially 
at the time of uh, Sri Ramakrishna's advent. Um, so what is true religion? Uh, the God realization is the purpose of religion. Um, true religion is devotion, it is dispassion, it is knowledge. Uh, the purpose of life is enlightenment. And these are the different paths to enlightenment. That religion is a path to God. Seems so simple. But it's, it, it took somebody like Sri Ramakrishna to say it out and Vivekananda to proclaim it to the world. Otherwise, you go to, I, I spent one year at the divinity school. Uh, do they know that? Not really. So religion might be something which gives ethics to humanity, is important for social cohesion uh, or something or the other. Uh, a dozen different approaches to religion. The core of religion. See, why does this happen? It happens because you lose faith in God. It happens because people stop really believing that there's such a thing as God and then start looking for why does this religion exist at all? Why does there anything called religion? Then they try to look for economic reasons, social reasons, political reasons, so and so forth. Uh, or at best ethical reasons. So what is true religion? The incarnation establishes it and also sets out a new path. Um, the avatar himself is a path of spirituality. Quite apart from devotion, knowledge, meditation, Advaita, all of that is there. They are all there eternally. But the incarnation, uh, avatar, I have never heard the term avatar yoga, but it should be there. It is a very, very powerful path. If you look, in, look at Hinduism, most people who actually practice and are devoted, they are devoted either to Krishna or Rama, one of the incarnations of God. Lots of people in Hinduism. All of Christianity is built around an incarnation of God. There is no essence to Christianity without the incarnation. So the incarnation is very, very important to religion. And especially for people who want spiritual progress, a very powerful method is the incarnation of God. A very powerful, a very a great power which helps us in spiritual life is the incarnation. Sri Ramakrishna has compared it to the steamboat. You know, others can barely float across the river. The, he, by others he means... Great saints, a little twig floating across the river will float across and go to the ocean with the river. Remember, he lived at the, in the, at the end of the Ganges, uh, Ganga, where the Ganga flows into the, the Bay of Bengal. So it will float, everything floats into the ocean. So the river takes you to the ocean of Brahman. But if a, even a crow sits on the twig, it's going to sink. So... And you can actually see that uh, the crows flying across the river in Ganga and they, they might sometimes try to, they get tired, try to alight on a twig and they'll see it sinking if they put their weight on it. But a steamer can take hundreds of people across uh, without any fear, without any, any extra effort. So an avatar is like that. What would not have been possible for us spiritually in one life becomes possible by holding on to the avatar. So that is a, a central part of establishment or re-establishment of religion. Okay, we have some questions. Jayant, I'll stop at this point and take a few questions because uh, then the next verse is very important, requires separate treatment. Jayant? Namaskar. My question is my question is coming from a two years uh, training on Mandukya Upanishad. I mean, I, 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 I'm reconciled with that. We are, uh, we are born how we are born and because of karma. But when somebody says that I am born by my own Maya, hmm. that means I have to believe that there is a God. So again, there is no proof that there is a God. Am I correct? And, when I say God, I believe that there is only one God in the world has to be. I mean, there cannot be a God for Hindus and one God for Christians and one God for Islam. So how do I reconcile all of these things? I, all I right. Have a, my, I have disturbed myself and I worship. Yes. Uh, right. Day, uh, right. But uh, when it comes to reasoning, I, I, I get knocked off actually. Right. So you have asked three questions. Um, so is... Belief in God a matter of faith? Second, what is the proof that there is God? And is there one God or many gods? So you have asked, actually asked three questions. Um, so very briefly, 
I'll answer in one word each of them and then we'll take a little more time on, on the questions. First of all, is it a matter of faith? Yes, it's a matter of faith. Uh, it's not like Advaita Vedanta. So this is definitely a matter of faith. We're, what Krishna is saying here has to be accepted by Arjuna as a matter of faith or belief. Second, um, is there proof? Yes and no. We've discussed what, what do you mean by proof and what kind of proof. Third, uh, is there one God? Yes, definitely. That was the great advance of monotheism, that, uh, you know, Judaism, which said that there is one God. And in Hinduism, you find multiplicity of devatas and then culminating in one God of the universe. So there is one power which creates, preserves and destroys the universe. Except that in Hinduism, it can be understood in many, many different ways because of its inf infinite nature. All right, little more time on each of these questions. Is it a matter of faith? Yes, it's a matter of matter of faith. In contrast with what's going on in Mandukya Upanishad or Mandukya Karika. In Mandukya Karika, it's a matter of experience and reason. Not just experience. Everybody has experience. That does not become, mean that they become Advaitins or become enlightened. You need the, the teachings uh, the, which, which talk about your experience. What experience? Waking, dreaming, deep sleep in the Mandukya. All of the Upanishads are like that. They talk about your experience and, and guide you towards enlightenment, self-realization. That is what Krishna was talking about in the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, self-realization. There Arjuna will not ask, even you will not ask, what is the proof that I exist? Nobody asks that. I exist. What is the nature? Advaita says, I am existence, consciousness, bliss and infinite being. That, that, that will require investigation. But the subject matter about which Advaita Vedanta says that um, uh, you are Satchidananda, you are the Atman or Brahman, that one nobody doubts. Even the Buddhist does not doubt it. The Buddhist says it's a stream of uh, flickering consciousness, momentary consciousness. But it does not doubt that we experience a self. What is the nature of the self? That's open to question. But the nature of God is a matter of faith. The nature of God is a matter of, matter of faith. Um, now, this, uh, the second question, is there proof? Yes, uh, the, all the theistic religions, the religions which believe in the existence of God, a common, for, first of all, you have to define what is God. One useful way of defining God is all the theistic religions in India, in Hinduism, and also in the Middle East, whether Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Zoroastrianism, they all think of God as the creator. So, the most ancient texts think of God as the creator. You can think of ancient man thinking about this universe, looking at this universe and asking, what is behind all this? Where did all this come from? So, one thing is, where did all this come from? So, they thought there must be some supreme power which can make all this God. Second thing is, who, is there something, is the power which controls all of this? An, ama an amazing power. Yes, so that's another thing about God, omnipotent. And you add omniscient to it. So, the cause of the universe, that's a common idea among all theistic religions, and also has excellent qualities like omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, and so on and so forth. Such a being, is there proof? I actually have a two-hour lecture on this, proofs of the existence of God. But every theistic religion has uh, tried to prove the existence of God. Uh, in Christianity, you have the famous five, the five proofs of the existence of God. The Nyaya philosopher in India, the Nyayikas, the Nyaya school, they were famous for, they were believers in God and they tried to prove the existence of God. Their opponents were the Buddhists who said, who denied two things. There is no permanent eternal soul, one, Atma, no Atma, and there is no God of this universe. So that's what they debated with against the ancient Hindus, a debate which lasted nearly a thousand years. Who won? Both sides claim big victory, but anyway. But what, what won was Indian philosophy, because so many texts, so many, it's a wonderful flowering, development of Indian philosophy. Udayan Acharya was one of the great uh, Nyaya philosophers. Nyayakas already had a, a tradition of giving proofs for the existence of God. He gives nine proofs of the existence of God. So, what are these proofs? Maybe one day we can have a separate talk. Uh, I can introduce you to the proofs of the existence of God. 
Now, okay, yes. Now, um, uh, how are they proofs? As I said, yes and no. You will see all of these are proofs only in the sense a lawyer would, would try to prove something. What does a lawyer do? The lawyer, he or she piles up evidence to convince the judge and the jury of, of the merits of the case. So a lot of evidence. So the, uh, the proof of the lawyer, the so-called proof of the lawyer is not a mathematical proof, not even a scientific proof. It's um, a persuasive proof, an argumentative, like um, I'm trying to persuade you of the merits of my case. You may choose to be convinced or may not be. That does not mean I'm just telling you, you have to believe me. No lawyer ever says you have to believe me. I'm trying to show you why I am right. And so are you convinced or not? All of these proofs are like that. The proof from first cause, the proof of design, proof by design, the proof of teleology, but there's a purpose of the whole universe, from moral, from the argument from the moral sense, um, the, the interesting ontological argument. All of these are uh, sort of persuasive, but they are not like mathematical proofs where uh, you don't have to persuade. If anybody understands mathematics, the thing is done. And mathematical proofs are also proof against any kind of evidence. There is no question of it being refuted later when new evidence comes up. No, it depends entirely on internal logic. So anybody who has understood mathematics will understand the proofs, will be convinced by it. There is no other way. If you are not convinced by a mathematical proof, the only thing is that you have not understood it. So these proofs are not like that. Um, are they convincing? Depends. If you are already a believer, if you believe in God or you would like to believe in God, you will like these proofs. If you are not convinced, if you take these proofs to Richard Dawkins, you will be laughed <laughs> out. Then no, the one, a skeptic, is not going to believe in any of these proofs. In fact, I know of a famous uh, philosopher, maybe Anthony Kenny, I, I forget, very well-known philosopher, contemporary, who started out by training to be a priest, a Catholic priest. And in part of his training, he studied the proofs of the existence of God. And he thought, ah, now I can't believe in God. If this, these are the proofs that I have, I lose my... So he became a philosopher instead of a theologian. So that's that. One interesting footnote here is, probably the greatest mathematician, logician of our age, Kurt Godel, who was right here in Princeton, in the Institute of Advanced Studies. He is very known, well known for his incompleteness theorems and uh, the incredible brain. But not many people know that among his unfinished work was a mathematical proof of the existence of God. So right here, the finest scientific brains in the uh, Institute of Advanced Studies, a colleague of Einstein, who, who uh, Einstein was the only one Godel spoke to. He didn't trust anybody, did not like anybody. And Einstein liked everybody and trusted everybody. So Einstein spoke to everybody, the neighbors and the neighbor's kid and the staff members and professors and everybody. And, uh, and also Godel. Uh, but Godel spoke only to Einstein and they argued over it. So if you Google it, Godel's proof of God, it's, a, it's supposed to be an incomplete kind of effort. But imagine a brain like that, a man like that thought it worthwhile. Um, that one can actually prove the existence of God. One God or many gods? One God. Uh, the movement has always been from polytheism to monotheism. But Advaita Vedanta goes beyond that. See, what Advaita Vedanta says is that there is one ultimate reality which appears as three. Brahman, because of Maya, appears as three things. Uh, one is God, the universe, and individual beings like us, Jeeva, uh, Ishvara, Jiva, Jagat. All three are ultimately not real. They are, they are Brahman. Not real means they are Brahman. They are really Brahman. God is really, Brahman I mean Nirguna Brahman, the absolute. Coming through Maya, Nirguna Brahman plus Maya becomes Ishvara or Saguna Brahman. And Saguna Brahman produces this universe and helps in producing our bodies and minds. Another product of Maya, Maya makes Nirguna Brahman appear as individual sentient beings. And uh, our bodies and minds are given to us by this world, Jagat, which is, which is created by Ishvara. So we have a triangle, God, world, I, 
the individual being. What Advaita says is, the reality of all of this is Brahman. All right. Maharaj, is it possible that Sri Ramachandra was incarnate, born as Krishna, and that Krishna was born as Ramakrishna? Did yes, yes, of Ramakrishna course. Said, it, it, it is the same. It is the same God. So it is the same God. Yes, yes, it is the same God. When Krishna says, "I have had many births previously." He, he, what does he mean? He means all the incarnations in all ages, known and unknown. We do not know of many things. So it is, it is, there is only one God who incarnates in all these ways. I, I am, there is a new fashion in academics now, in um, theological studies. There is always a resistance to this idea that ultimately all religions are speaking about uh, the same thing, um, ultimately. In, in details, they are obviously different. There is nobody who is denying it. But there is a new academic pushback against the perennial philosophy. They say, no, 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 the religions are different. They are different. Everybody knows that. And ultimately, is it one reality they are pointing towards? Is it now this, it's academically fashionable to say, no. It's fashionable to find difference everywhere. So, no. Uh, they are pointing towards different realities. I have never understood that. When you say that Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, um, uh, Hinduism, they are pointing to different realities. Are you talking, then are you admitting polytheism? Which is obviously <laughs> impossible for uh, especially a Western theologian with a Judeo Christian background to admit. See, what I, what I think is that the, what is behind this kind of uh, push against the perennial philosophy is, first of all, the influence of postmodernism, where uh, you have to find difference in everything. Uh, there cannot be any grand unifying narrative. Everything has to be different. And also, everything has to be false. That also is uh, uh, at the background. And allied to this, there might be a kind of fanaticism, a, a kind of uh, remnant of fanaticism. Remember, a fanatic always says, um, yes, there are different religions, but there is only one true religion. And somehow it happens to be mine. <laughs> So, there, there are different gods, but there is only one god and the others are not true. And somehow that one god happens to be the one that that speaker is talking about, that my god. So, that is the fanatic. Now, it is no longer to be, no longer fashionable nor acceptable to be fanatical in that sense. People will laugh at you. It will be politically incorrect. So, a strategic way of being fanatic is not to accept that the, my religion is saying the same thing as your religion ultimately. No, my religion is saying something different. Your religion is saying something different. Every religion is saying something different and the footnote, footnote would say those ones are wrong and mine is correct. That is a, a sneaky way of introducing fanaticism. And these are my theories and why, uh, I mean just to compare that the two books, one is Aldous Huxley's classic, the perennial philosophy, I think 1960s and uh, or 50s. And then there is a new one, God is not one, I forget the name of the author. I read this book also. Even in quality it does not compare. You may read one paragraph Aldous Aldous Huxley's English and uh, this uh, new academician saying, it does not compare. Uh, arguments do not compare. Then you, you begin to under, uh, question what is the purpose of this book? Why is it being written? What is the agenda behind it? And the agenda is basically it stinks basically. Um, okay. God is not one. Yeah. Um, Stephen Prasero, that's right, that's the book. I'm not recommending it, by the way. But if you want to read, if you want to read Aldous Huxley's uh, perennial philosophy, it's really worth reading. Uh, who else raised the hand? Krishi, you are next. Swamiji. Yes. Um, I, I wanted to ask you this question. You told us the other night about a, an ancient monk who you had been around during World War II, and when you asked him what that experience was, his reply was. What concern is that to us? Yes. Krishna, on the other hand, advises Arjuna to take action, actively to destroy evil, but established in yoga. Now, I can sort of understand both these statements because despite the fact that they're somewhat contradictory, one is being indifferent and the other being active. But my question is this, given the, given the current situation with, you know, politics, the pandemic and the recession, what should an unenlightened person like me do? 
Should I be as indifferent as the old monk, uh, rationalize evil as a, a mere appearance in Brahman that I can't do anything about? Or do I engage in action, though I am far from being, you know, established in yoga, so to speak? It's a difficult question, but a good question, nevertheless. That Swami was, Swami Pavanarandi, he was an Irishman who lived all his, you know, after becoming a monk, lived, lived the rest of his life in Dyoghar, in, uh, in the ashram which I joined. A very wonderful old Swami. But why he advised me that way, there are, there are a certain point to it. First of all, here is this young novice who is supposed to concentrate on philosophy and meditation and service and spending all his time reading. In that, luckily at that time there was no internet and nothing like that. So the only sources were encyclopedias. Who's, who's pouring over uh, the Second World War entries in encyclopedias and, and uh, it's a fascination. In monastic life, one has to be careful to, um, to be careful about these fascinations. Otherwise, what happens is your focus should be the four yogas, um, you know, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga and Raja Yoga. Um, as a part of that, your Karma Yoga, you might read uh, in the Second World War if you're asked to teach history, as I was asked to teach history. But he noticed it was going beyond the, uh, the, the, just the need for Karma Yoga. It's just a personal fascination. So, it's actually very, very laudable what he talked about, that, uh, that he, was, he was an Irishman, a European, in India during the Second World War. The very natural thing would have been to pour over at that time maybe the radio news or the newspapers, whatever he got over and uh, whatever he got at that time and to follow the war and details and everything. No, he chose not to be involved in that. Was he indifferent? No, well, he was always very active. Active in the field of Karma Yoga which was given to him, which was serving the students who studied there. He always taught. He was the one who introduced hockey into that school. He was the one who taught English to the students all his life. Generations. Grandfather, father and son have studied under him. So, a life of service. He was not indifferent at all. But then, that's one thing. He's a monk. Now we are part of society here. And you are asking from your perspective. The answer is something that you have to find yourself. I'll give you two examples. One is... Um, in the First World War, in Cambridge. So Bertrand Russell and uh, the great philosopher Wittgenstein, Russell and Wittgenstein. Russell decided not to fight the war, pacifist. He was actually put in jail, I think, and he was dismissed. Because in, during the war, when your country is fighting, uh, and you say, I, I will be a pacifist, I will not join the war. He stood up for his ideals, he suffered for it, he paid for it. Wittgenstein, on the other hand, uh, he said, I have to fight for my country. The honest thing to do is to fight for your country. And he went and joined the army. This super philosopher, the uh, Austrian army, and he fought in the battle. He was even reckless, it seems, when, when you read about his life. And he was put in, after the war, they lost the war. He was put in a prisoner of war camp. He paid his dues. He felt that it is honest to suffer with everybody else. Uh, now, what is right? What I noticed, one common thing among both of them, that uh, they were willing to sacrifice for their ideals. Both Russell, who said, I will not fight, I'm a pacifist. And Wittgenstein, who said, I have to fight for my country. Right or wrong, it's my country, patriotic duty, I have to do. And both of them suffered for it. The second example I want to share is, um, Swami, I've said this earlier also, Shivanandaji, I really like that. He was the president of the order in Belurmat, and one gentleman, uh, he used to come visit him. So one day he came and he was saying, at that time Gandhiji was fighting for the independence of India. He was leading the non-cooperation movement against the British. And people uh, in Calcutta, the, many, the young people were joining that movement to fight against the British. And this gentleman was disapproving of the whole thing. He was telling Mahapurush Maharaj, Swami Shivanandaji, Swamiji, is it right that these young people, they are not f finishing their, their studies, they are neglecting their studies and dropping out of college and this Gandhi is just a troublemaker, you know, fighting against the British Empire, who ever heard of such a thing? And uh, is this right? So, Swami Shivananda just said, hmm, yeah. The next day he came again 
That day, a young man had come to become a monk. He bowed down before Swami Shivananda, got his blessings and went up to the monastery to become a monk. And the gentleman was watching the whole proceedings and he said, Swami, is this right? You know, when the, we are a colonized country and Gandhiji is fighting for the freedom of the country, is this, isn't this selfish to give up this entire struggle and become a monk and sit in meditation, close your eyes to what is going on in society outside? Then Swami Shivananda could take it no more. He said, look here. Gandhiji, in his complete you know, engagement, he is fighting against the British for the independence of India, he is trying to reform uh, Hindu society and overcome unto untouchability. Uh, so many things are going on, uh, instituting education, uh, so many things he is doing. And I am sure he is perfectly at peace. He's a, he has joy and peace and calmness within. And this young man has come with such a high ideal, I will give up all worldly ambition all greed and lust and I will, um, I will search for God. I will meditate and pray and serve and have one pointed request for God. He too will find peace. The only one I see without any peace is you, <laughs> who is doing neither. So that is one thing. Definitely one must be engaged. Um, I, in this case, I like that, what do you call it? The serenity prayer. And the, the theologian uh, Naibur, I think, he said, uh, Lord, give me the courage to change the things that I can change, the patience to bear that which I cannot change, and the wisdom to know the difference. <laughs> yeah, that's true. All right. Um, there's one more question. Yeah, Swamiji, I wanted to know the difference between own avatar and anshavatar. Oh, that is a whole avatarology. There is no such sub subject. But there is a subject like Christology and there is a subject called Buddhology also. So, the different kinds of avatars. Some are like Krishna and Rama are regarded as Purna avatar. That uh, they manifest uh, all the glories of God. Some are Amsha avatar. They manifest in one aspect of, of divine power. But they are also incarnations of God. So, I don't know too much. I am too much of a dry non-dualist. And I don't have all the details on avatars. Alright, I think we have run out of time. So, um, one more. Let me look at the chat. There were a lot of interesting questions. Um, Which text of Bhagavad Gita would you recommend? Anyone. Here is the Ramakrishna Mission text. Um, this is a translation of Shankaracharya's commentary. Bhagavad Gita with the commentary of Shankaracharya. Um, then you have so many. Uh, there's Feuerstein's. Um, the one which we used at Harvard. I can show you the text right now. It's right here. This is a solid new translation. This is the one was used as a textbook at Harvard. Bhagavad Gita new translation, uh, George Feuerstein. He was a noted expert on yoga. This book. Can you see? George Feuerstein. And there's another one which we used. Um, this one was actually published recently by Cambridge University. She is a professor at Cambridge University, I think, uh, Angelica Malinar. I think she's a professor at Cambridge. So this is the book, The Bhagavad Gita Doctr Doctrines and Contents by Malinar, Publi publication Cambridge University. Doctrine. Now, don't uh, look at this book for spiritual inspiration. This is a completely academic text. So you'll come across things like, so today when I was uh, preparing for this, so what does... Uh, Professor Malinar say, 
So at the beginning of the fourth chapter, Krishna declares himself as an incarnation. Probably these verses were composed at a later date than the rest of the chapter because they don't match the contents of the other part of the chapter. So you'll immediately get into this part has been inserted later on, that part was written by somebody else, this part doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't, Krishna himself would be confused if he <laughs> reached this book. But it's a solid academic te text. Uh, I must uh, say a uh, lot of good information is there. She has studied uh, Mahabharata thoroughly and many other texts and she has uh, uh, bought in. She is at the University of London, School of Oriental and African Studies. It's a famous school, SOAS, the University of London. Yeah, these are two. There are any number of translations. There was also a recent one in poetic translation called God Song. Actually, Bhagavad Gita, if you literally translate it in English, it will mean God Song. So, the name of the book is God Song. And the book was reviewed in the New York Times. And the New York Times reviewer said that apparently to read the Bhagavad Gita is to be possessed by an irresistible desire to translate it. So, <laughs> so there have been so many, many translations. A couple of years back, Yale University had a summer camp on translations of the Bhagavad Gita. So they collected every uh, translation in English, I think. Yes. So they made a library of Bhagavad Gita at Yale University. All right. Um, it seems that many incarnations of Vishnu are a result of a Rishi's curse. Uh, there's, there's some reason for an incarnation. I've heard that avatars can be of different degrees, correct. Rama, full avatar, Lakshmana is an avatar of, um, um, of Sheshanaga, Lakshmana, yes. And there's, there's a whole field of research, who is whose avatar? Um, I found English translation of Ram Sukhdalji's commentary on um, Eknath Ishwaran's commentary is nice. It's very, uh, like all of his writings, it's very lucid, inspiring, poetic. Yeah. You need to have an inspiring translation. The one from the, from the uh, Vedanta Society of, Society of Southern California, which was done by Christopher Isherwood in consultation with uh, Swami Prabhavanandaji. Very nice, a very poetic, but it's a poetic translation. It's not a precise translation from the Sanskrit, very poetic. Um, Yes, so these are some, there are many, many, many translations. Then, Ram Sukhdas, just trans if you want to read that, very good. The Hindi is nice actually. It's a very voluminous uh, commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. But if, if you don't know Hindi, then English is good. All right then, let's uh, bring it to a close. The ninth verse is actually an important verse. I should uh, not hurry through it. We should start it in the next class. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu